Okay, hello YouTube. Um, today's video is going to be about endgames. It's actually going to be about specifically uh, bishop versus knight endgames. And if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, um, please go ahead and hit that uh, like button and please hit subscribe. It really does help me out and it'll help me keep bringing you more content like this. So anyways, um, bishop versus knight endgames. Really what you need to know is you need to know when the bishop is better than the knight and when the knight is better than the bishop. Now normally when people explain this they'll give you some oversimplified position uh, typically where a lot of times the position is still a draw <laughs> and it doesn't really give you a really good impression of when one piece is actually significantly better than the other. So part of the problem is, is we tend to use general rules to describe when a bishop is better than a knight and when a knight is better than a bishop. But of course, there's one huge overriding rule when it comes to endgames in general, which is you need two weaknesses in a position to win. So without having those two weaknesses, just because a bishop is better than a knight on some superficial scale doesn't really mean a whole lot. So for starters, in general, on an open board, a bishop is going to be a little bit better than a knight. A bishop simply controls more squares. On an open board, a bishop will control 13 squares, uh, whereas a knight in the middle of the board will only control 8. Now that being said, there are some circumstances that favor a bishop versus a knight, and there's some circumstances that favor a knight versus a bishop. Knights tend to function better in closed positions. Knights also tend to function better if there's pawns only on one side of the board. You'll notice in this particular example, pawns are only on one side of the board. And also in this particular example, this is actually white to move and win, which is going to demonstrate my other, <laughs> which is going to demonstrate my other point pretty cleanly. Okay, so pawns on one side of the board. Also, um, we have a thing called a good bishop. So if a person's bishop is on the opposite color of their pawns, that's generally speaking a good thing. If the bishop is on the same color of the pawns, that's generally speaking a bad thing. So knights, again, they function better in closed positions. So that's if the pawn structure is locked. So you can see these pawn structures locked here. That would normally be a favorable thing for the knight. This is, of course, an exception. So this position is white to move and win, so stop and pause the video and see if you can find it. So the answer is bishop to b5. Now, the reason bishop b5 is such a powerful move is because it locks down two really solid weaknesses. The first thing it does is it demonstrates why a bishop is better than a knight 90% of the time, and it demonstrates that really cleanly. This bishop is controlling every single square that this knight can go to. Um, this knight is trapped, and actually this knight constitutes now a weakness in the position, and white can exploit that weakness by um, going towards the knight and possibly capturing it with his king, by taking that king and traveling towards the knight. Now, it would be easy enough for this black king to come over here and block the king from entering, but we do have this second weakness over here. We have these pawns back here, that the king or the bishop can try to get to. So basically what would happen is, is this king on g7 is going to have to actually babysit these pawns. Because at any point we can play possibly bishop e8 and back, but also we can just bring our king up to the e5 square, keeping this knight trapped. So we could do something like this, and this king could permanently kind of hang out over here, and eventually they would have to pick what they need to defend. They either need to defend these pawns or they need to defend these knights. So if they hang out and defend these pawns, we could certainly go after the knight, but of course this knight is still trapped. The, probably the best would be to simply attack this pawn and say, okay, now you have to move either your king or your knight, and either one of these moves will lose material for you. And basically all the pawns here are going to fall because this king has to give way. We're going to take this pawn. We're going to come over. We're going to take that pawn. And that's going to be the end of the game. So that's a classic example of just where a bishop is better than the knight and where we clearly have enough to win. We have um, two weaknesses in the position. We have a weakness over here on these pawns that we can attack. And we have a weakness right here. So, okay, so let's see a situation where the knight is better than the bishop. I'm going to bring up that situation next. This is a situation where the knight is actually better than the bishop. As you can see, we have a lot of bad things 
have happened for this uh, poor bishop here on uh, e8. For starters, all of black's pawns are on light squares. Okay, so now you would think that the ideal thing for white would to have all of would be to have all of his pawns on dark squares, locking those pawns down on light squares. And in a lot of videos that talk about knight versus bishop, they'll have some scenarios set up like that. And that always annoyed me because a lot of times those scenarios would still be draws because they would be totally ignoring the fact that you still need two weaknesses to attack. It's actually better for white to have a couple of his pawns on light squares here because he actually needs that square f4 available for him so that he can attack these two very clean weaknesses here and here. And it's also nice for him to be able to add pressure to one of those weaknesses with king d4, c5, d6, etc. So if you haven't already guessed it, in this position it's white to move and win. And the move is uh, knight f4, putting pressure on these two weaknesses. And then after this weakness gets defended, which in this case there's only one way to defend it, we have to defend it with bishop f7, we're simply going to march this king up here. And there isn't a good way to liquidate any of these weaknesses, meaning there's no good way to play g5 in a timely manner before we're going to start um, chomping down on the e6 square. And there's just not going to be any good way to defend. We're just kind of hanging out. We could try to play king h6, g5. That's going to be too slow. By the time we do it, we're going to be losing on e6. And we don't have time to get to the e6 square before the king gets there and starts capturing stuff. And of course, even if we did, we probably still could force some sort of zigzwang with white, which zigzwang means the compulsion to move. We would just eventually force black to make a move, force black to give way, and we would be able to continue to make progress and eventually win. This is an ideal scenario for the knight. This is where the knight is clearly better than the bishop. We have pawns on the same side of the board, and the bishop is locked behind those pawns. Uh, this is not a good scenario. So another type of weakness that we can exploit in positions is if we have um, some passed pawns that we can work with. So this next scenario is a basic kingside bind scenario. So we have this basic kingside bind scenario over here. Now what that means is that we're always going to have the ability to create a passed pawn with the idea of playing f5 and f6 to create a passed pawn at some point. Now this scenario I, uh, is an invention, but I have the next example is going to be a practical example of the scenario that came from a game. So white will always be able to create a passed pawn with f5 and f6. So basically white here has two potential weaknesses he can exploit, even though one is firmly guarded right now. Basically the king is hanging out over here guarding the potential infiltration of this king coming to b7, but b7 still counts as a weakness that black still needs to keep his eyes on. You'll also notice that we have a good favorable situation for bishop versus knight. We have pieces on both sides of the board, and we do have that bishop lined up exactly two squares away from the knight, which is ideal for preventing forward movement of the knight, even if we're not completely trapping the knight like we were in the other example. This is considered an ideal situation for preventing this knight from moving forward. So basically, if it's white to move here, the main idea is, and pause in the video and see if you can find it, but the main idea is f5. We're going to start creating that passed pawn. It's very difficult to respond here once white plays f5. It's actually really important that if you're in this endgame or about to get into this endgame as black, that you play a move like g6 kind of early on um, to prevent this pawn structure from happening. And you need to play that when your king is over here. Because if you played it now, if it was like black's move and black played g6, we would play g5 and create a passed pawn on the h file. So that's something we need to be cautious about at this point. Um, if you're about to get into this type of ending and you still have a king over here, make sure you use that opportunity to play a move like g6 when white still doesn't have time to play a move like g5. So anyway, so the idea is f5, and let's say they take. Let's say they play e takes f5, we're going to play g takes f5, and that gives us the two weaknesses we need. We have a potential passed pawn on the e file, and then we have 
um, the king coming over here. So another way of putting it is it doesn't necessarily need to be two weaknesses. It can be one weakness and a threat, or it could possibly be two threats. So you need at least two of something to work with. If you've only got one weakness that you can attack, they can simply hunker down, they can defend that weakness, and there's no way you can possibly win. If you've only got one threat, same thing. If I only had the threat of the past epon, this king could simply march in front of that past epon, hunker down, and I wouldn't be able to win. But in this case, let's say that king starts heading back to stop that epon. I can bring my king up, and then after a few more moves, I can lock his pawns. I can force that past pawn, and now I have plenty of weaknesses to work with. I can play e6. I'm threatening uh, g7 followed by uh, h6. I'm also threatening to come in king d5, king c5, and king b5. So at this point, there there is no defending everything. So like fe6, fe6, king here, we're going to take here. Now I have the threat of this outside pass pawn, also the threat of coming into c5. So not everything can be stopped. So we create the outside pass pawn, which distracts the king, and then we bring our king over to d5, c5, b5, a4 is completely winning for white. As you can see here, there would be no way to defend since the c7 square is covered. So then we would play king b5, king a4. So that's another scenario where the bishop is better than the knight in a kingside bind. So let's see how this plays out in some practical examples. So we have this practical example here. This is... Uh, a game, uh, uh, Sergei Sokolov uh, versus Abramov in St. Petersburg in 2005. So you can see this is very similar to exactly what we were talking about. We have a king side bind, and in this case, uh, that's all we have. We just kind of have the king side bind, uh, but we have two weaknesses that we can work with. We have a king side bind, plus we have pressure here. We have a good bishop versus a bad bishop. This bishop on e7 is bad, and this bishop on e3 is good, and it's targeting a weak pawn. So let's see how easy this was for white to exploit. So the first thing that white did is on white's last move, he actually played the move pawn to f5, which helped create this potential passed pawn. This knight retreated to d7, so as you can see, he's hunkering down and defending this weakness. But this, of course, is not the only weakness he has. He also has the problem of after pawn to f6, white is threatening to create pass pawns all over the place on that king side. So if, for example, we play g takes f6, we're going to play bishop takes h6, and we're going to be creating some pass pawns over here, and this will actually eventually lead to a win for white. So after f6 and then bishop to f8, what we're going to do here is we're going to play g5. This creates a passed pawn on the king side. So after um, takes, we would play takes, king over, and then we're going to play bishop f4 check, just kicking that king away. Uh, the only move that I guess black could come up with was the move e5, and then white continues with knight takes e5, and then black resigned. But black didn't have a lot better in this situation because no matter what happens he's going to be allowing some sort of pass pawn over here and there wasn't any type of fancy exchange that wasn't going to allow some sort of pass pawn or some massive wind of material in this position so another example of a uh, practical example of what we're talking about is this example. This is actually Burns Amos versus Alexander Alakine. And this is one of the few cases where you're going to see Alexander Alakine actually um, lose and actually end up on the uh, bad end of a bad bishop. So in this case, Alexander Alakine, he was playing the French defense, and he ended up in this position where he ends up with the nightmare scenario of the only piece that's left is that French bishop, and it happens to be on the same color square of every single pawn that Alexander Alakine has. In this case, it absolutely does not matter that all of the pawns are on light. It doesn't matter that the pawns are on opposite sides of the board because the pawns are all on light squares. Also, there are two very accessible weaknesses for white to go ahead and try to exploit. He's got two things that he can attack, and he's got two points of infiltration. The knight can come back and attack these pawns, but also the king can threaten to infiltrate via this um, rank. So... This was actually pretty easy technique from here. Um, there was a lot of dancing around before we got here, but once he got here, it was pretty much over. Um, Alexander Alakine's opponent 
played knight to a6. Unfortunately, uh, black doesn't have a great move here. He played bishop to e8, and then after knight to c5, he won this pawn on the e6 square. Uh, if he had played something like bishop to c8 to just try to hang out and hold that pawn, knight c5 check, king c6, king back to a4, king b6, king b4, king c6, king a5 would have tempoed everything. Notice how this bishop is again trapped by the knight, which is rare. We, we, we see this usually the bishop trapping uh, the knight. In this case, it's the knight dominating the bishop because the bishop is blocked again by its own pawns. And the knight is effectively just functioning on one side of the board, where the knight functions very ideally against a bishop. So then it would be king c7, king to b5. We're going after this pawn on e6. We're going to play here, here, here. And at this point, this black king has to give way. So here, for example, we could play bishop d7. In this case, we would just play knight takes d7, king d7, king b6. And there's nothing preventing us from taking that pawn on e6. So basically, Alakine um, lost the pawn after knight c5, king c6, knight takes e6. He continued to play on from here, but of course now white has a very easily exploitable weakness on g6, but also a secondary threat with the passed pawn on e5, and white went on to win this very easily. So anyway, so that's it. That's knight versus bishop. When the knight is better than the bishop, when the bishop is better than knight, and how we can win these positions um, with both sides. Anyways, I hope you found this video helpful, I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you learned something that you can use in your own games that will help you win games. Thank you very much for watching.